introduction. Thank you. Um, so let me start my screen first and uh, start with today's uh, presentation. Let me know when you've seen the screen. Yes. All right, and uh, I'm on the presentation mode now. Is it uh, visible to everybody? Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Brilliant, okay. Um, thank you so much all, and thank you so much all for organizers as well. Um, thank you. Uh, the opportunity here um, has arisen obviously to discuss pharmaceutical product development. And it is one of the topic that has been discussed um, quite extensively around the world in, in, in light of, or in let's say situation of COVID. And the uh, whole world has got this attention that what is, what is this um, product development, uh, what happens in a product development and what pharmaceutical companies are doing in, in, in a situation where we have this virus and, uh, and how pharmaceutical companies are kind of uh, developing treatment for it. Um, pharmaceutical research um, has been an area of interest for, for, for many reasons. So first of all, um, obviously there's a healthcare involved. Uh, so we are um, developing medications which brings life-changing um, um, effect in people, patients' life. Uh, so that is the noble objective of the profession itself. And what also has happened over the last 40, 50 years that uh, big investors around the world, they are looking into investing their money in pharmaceutical research because if, pharma if, if pharmaceutical companies develop a blockbuster or a molecule that can actually cure or treat certain disease conditions, then obviously they get a return of investment. So there's, a, there's obviously financial benefits involved. And um, for students like us, I mean, I call myself student because I'm, I'm in process of constant learning. Um, what we also see is that uh, with every single molecule that comes to the market, there's an advancement in scientific and technical understanding. So for me, but personally, pharmaceutical research or pharmaceutical product development um, is something that uh, I was always interested in. And uh, the real reason why I kind of uh, I'm interested in this field is because it's my passion. Um, I love working with challenging molecules. I love working with challenging products. And um, in the process, um, you know, I've learned so many things. So I will start a little bit um, um, with my introduction. So I have um, a bachelor degree from India and a master degree from India, and I also have a master degree from pharmaceutical. Well, this is from King's College in Pharmaceutical Technology in London. And this education is very important because these are the foundation of what actually I actually am applying currently in my, in my job roles. So this foundation is key for your success. So everybody who is a student out there, please pay attention to your subjects and I will give you relevant examples as well throughout the presentation to, to tell you why and how you can apply certain knowledge skills um, in future. So please pay attention to your education. A um, little bit about my experience. So as you can see, I have taken various roles um, and these roles are of increasing responsibility. And what I have actually accomplished in those all roles is, um, when I started my career in, in MCURE in India, I was working on a generic product. And as you all perhaps know, a generic product is basically a product that is being sort of developed uh, to match the, the pharmaceutical or, or biopharmaceutical um, equivalency of an existing product. Um, so basically an innovator, a pharmaceutical research company has launched a product and a generic company or generic manufacturer is trying to basically copy that product. Um, that, uh, that is when um, I started thinking that this is, not, uh, this is not something that I'm interested in because 
for me, working on new product simply means working on new molecules. And that actually drove me towards um, coming to UK and started uh, my journey in UK. The first company I worked with um, um, in, in, in UK was a company called QCEPT. And this company was a spin-out company in collaboration with UCL, which is University College London. And um, this, this story is quite uh, important for me personally. And I think people out there can also take some message from this that UCL is a pharmaceutical um, institution. They provide pharmacy education. But what was also happening that they were helping students who were doing research activities within the institute to commercialize their ideas. So PhD students, they have a unique idea and they're trying to find commercial application to it. So they had some patented technologies which had potential to help bigger pharmaceutical companies. So QCEPT was basically a contract research organization trying to provide solubility enhancement uh, technologies to bigger pharmaceutical companies. And that is where I got chance to work with um, um, sort of real scientists, real products, and and also in, in, in a role as a research scientist, uh, I was quite uh, uh, client facing. So any challenges, any issues uh, with the product development, uh, you interacting with bigger pharmaceutical companies because they are, they have product pipeline and um, some molecules are suffering from solubility or permeability issues. And what they're trying to do is give, give these sort of challenging molecules to smaller companies like USEPT uh, to uh, enhance their solubility or permeability using some novel or patented technologies. So what I learned there was um, um, there are different uh, technologies which can be commercialized with help of institutions. So pharmaceutical institutions in India, they can actually set up their own pharmaceutical companies. And those pharmaceutical companies can then work with bigger pharmaceutical companies to help them commercializing some of the challenging products they may have. So uh, there's a message there, there's a learning there. And that is how I got into pharmaceutical research. Uh, the next company I worked with is called MSD. It's also known as Marks Up and Rome. MSD, they specialized uh, in um, first time in human, um, or let's say phase one of the clinical research, phase one and phase two of the clinical research uh, for their product, anti-infective and HIV products. And um, there we were mainly working with uh, capsules. Um, so a new molecule developed uh, in form of granules, filled inside capsules, dosed in human first time, okay. And uh, then I moved to GSK. In GSK, I've taken various roles, as you can see. I have worked in uh, inhalation product development, and that was only for dry powder for inhalation. And then I worked in biologics as a senior scientist. And then I moved to industrialization team within GSK. Industrialization team is mainly to scale up the process, bring new product on site. And when I say new product, basically it's a new molecule being developed in form of tablet or capsules and we're trying to scale it up from phase two to phase three and commercial supplies. Um, so basically moving from a smaller scale batch to a bigger batch. Um, and then I've taken a role as a lead technologist leading some of the, some of the projects um, um, and they were of site strategy. And now I'm working as a product development leader or they call it product development manager, uh, managing portfolio of um, some injectable products. Uh, preparing for commercial launches in Europe and the U.S. market. Um, this is this is this is my journey, and and the reason I share this journey is that you can have this journey, you can learn from this journey. I come from a very small town in India. I don't have a PhD. Um, in fact, I never had a formal um, English education. So, what I'm trying to say here is that uh, don't let um, your current situation drive your future decisions. Because if you have passion and willingness to learn, and if you are uh, that type of person who likes challenges, so keep stretching your boundaries, keep asking um, question to yourself that what do you want to do next? I mean, in my journey, when I was part of this journey, I never thought that I would have opportunity to work on 
so many different products, so many different molecules with bigger companies in, in different roles. You know, when I started this journey, I had no visibility of my future. But one thing that was very, very um, sort of um, important for me was keep learning and constantly challenging myself. And uh, I request all the students that please, whatever your passion, goal, ambition, motivation is, please keep uh, working towards that. And sooner or later, you will definitely succeed. So there's, there's a message from here. Um, so let's just start with this presentation. Um, what is the objective of this presentation? All I'm trying to do is to give you a very high level overview of pharmaceutical product development process. And in the, in the process of that, I want to give you some technical scientific rational approach to how to go about it. And uh, in those examples, I will also tell you that how current pharmaceutical education is relevant or very much relevant to what pharmaceutical research companies are doing. So anything and everything you're doing in lab, in your institution, even general discussion, um, you know, these all things are relevant. Um, in a pharmaceutical company, you can have two different type of ladders. One is called scientific ladder, where you are very good in terms of scientific capabilities, knowledge, learning. And there's another ladder, which is called um, management ladder. So we call it uh, like people who are backbenchers and people who always you know, talking too much, not paying attention to education, or people who actually are not interested in education. You can have you can have career. Um, you can have um, sort of uh, managerial positions in a way that where if you are very good at managing people, if you are very good at articulation of facts, if you are very very good in communication and skill, then you know you don't necessarily need to have a very good scientific understanding. So there are things which I would mention about interpersonal skills. There will be certain personality traits. And these all will help you in terms of your um, development. So um, again, I'm not saying that you should not pay attention to education because without having basic understanding, you will not fly high. So please pay attention, uh, but also you know keep enjoying your life. Um, what is the product development and uh, why it takes so long and why and how this process actually takes place? This is all a very systematic process because what uh, FDA, WHO, EMA, all those regulatory agencies are trying to avoid is um, an unsafe medication coming in the market. Their idea is that you have a molecule which looks promising, but just because you have a molecule which actually is doing similar thing that an existing molecule in the market is doing, they will not give you license to, to, to commercialize it. And um, the reason they do it because uh, in order to maintain the, the scientific advancement, competitiveness in the market, they always promote pharmaceutical companies who are coming with novel ways of working, uh, treatment for new, new, new disease conditions, or if this is an existing molecule, then new indication, for an example, hydroxychloroquine was developed to treat malaria, but the new indication also showed that it could be used against COVID. Um, sildenafil citrate was developed for hypertension, but then it was used for erect erectile dysfunction. So you may be developing your molecule for a different condition, but then you may find a new application to it in, later in the product development. And um, this process is systemic, systematic in a way that um, you have to go through different stages of development and each stage has their own importance. And uh, the way this all data or information is compiled is called um, a dossier. And, uh, and a dossier is nothing but um, compilation of um, data from different stages of product development in a file, which could be in a CD, in an electronic format and it's, it's, it's organized in a very structured way so that uh, a reviewer who is actually uh, reviewing the new product, um, they can go straight to the point which they're interested in. So 
in a new drug application. So we all we only focusing on new drug um, application today, new product. Um, um, and uh, in a new drug application, you have five different modules. And those five modules actually takes uh, information from different stages in a way that the module one only has administrative information. For an example, um, where this uh, product is developed, what sort of uh, qualification people who actually developed uh, has, and um, all the important people within the business organization are listed in that uh, um, module. It also has um, sort of detail about how much fee that has been paid, where the facility is located, what sort of certification they have, um, pretty much administrative stuff in the module one. Module two is where you start compiling sort of summary of different stages. So summary of different stages, and when I say stages, it simply means clinical stages. So you have a new molecule, which you have given to a rat, mice, rabbit, and you're trying to assess if this is gonna be a safer medication in human, okay? So you're taking their organs out, you're trying to analyze the organs to see if there's some sort of toxicity when you have given this in a smaller dose. And then you increase the dose. And then you make an assessment whether this increase in dose of this new product, new molecule is actually causing any toxicity. And that allows you to titrate or to uh, come up with a dose that could be given or taken to phase one in human. And that sort of data is actually compiled in the module two, which is taking summary from um, different stages um, in clinical studies. Um, and then we go to module three. Uh, these modules are important for people who are actually working in regulatory affairs. So students who are interested in a career in regulatory affairs, please pay attention to this particular slide because um, when you are working in CMC regulatory affairs, where you are expected to know chemistry, manufacturing and control. So chemistry is all about uh, what was there in that molecule? What is the solubility? What is this? pH, what is this, um, let's say, absorption pattern, things like that, okay? Uh, there's, there's different things, molecular characterization, you know, you will have a lot of analytical techniques used, LCMS, GCMS, mass spec, just to give you idea about, um, you know, the structure of the molecule, molecular weight, um, those, those all information would go in that uh, section. And, um, when we enter in uh, module three, it's all about uh, manufacturing. It's all about manufacturing of drug substance and manufacturing of drug product. Drug substance is the active and drug product is basically uh, a final formulation which tend to be um, tablet in, in, in most, of the, most of the molecules for obvious reasons. And then you have non-clinical summary and then clinical summaries. In module four, you have data from animal studies. So this is a detailed, uh, detailed uh, report. And in the clinical summary in module five, there, there will be again, reports from um, clinical studies on human. And this dossier gets submitted to FDA. Uh, NDA is the term used for approval in the US market. FDA is the regulatory body in USA. And what they do is they go through your dossier. They try to find uh, um, all the information uh, which kind of proves that the drug or drug product is safe and effective. And uh, the manufacturing process you have developed is robust enough. The type of controls you have in the place are sufficient enough to provide them confidence that okay, you can manufacture this product uh, um, and you can manufacture it safely. Uh, you can manufacture it to the right quality every time you manufacture it. It's not just during the launch, but um, throughout the life cycle of the product. And th that sort of confidence um, is only provided with a lot of data that you generate. So you're gonna go through some of those data uh, later in the presentation. 
but this particular slide is just to give you um, sort of overview of what is expected as an output of all the hard work that you do in pharmaceutical research. And um, we talked about different things. We talked about molecular characterization. We talked about biopharmaceutics. We also talked about manufacturing. We talked about non-clinical studies in animals. We talked about clinical studies. So as a pharmaceutical student, uh, I know you are going through some of those subjects um, as we speak. And um, again, the expectation is that you should be able to understand this data, generate this data if needed, make some conclusive um, sort of um, summary from all the data that you see or generate, and then be able to convince the regulators that whatever you have reported um, is correct, is accurate, and uh, you will also be expected to have good analytical skill, not just in terms of analytical equipments, running the machines, developing the data, but also to be able to understand uh, what those data means, okay? Um, there are lots of expectation, but I don't want to scare you because, you know, this is why this course is designed for four years. And um, in each year you go for different subjects and those all subjects will equip you with all the things that you need to be able to work in a pharmaceutical research environment, okay? What actually is happening um, in, in pharmaceutical, let's say research labs, um, actually it has evolved a lot. When I was studying uh, my bachelor's, what we were doing is we were, we were studying the subject called medicinal chemistry. We would go in the lab and we would be asked to, you know, do some chemical reaction um, and change the functional group of an existing uh, molecule. Okay, and a lot of project uh, I see um, in, in, in academics um, is um, they have done some structural modification to an existing molecule and they're trying to find a new indication for it. So structural modification to an existing molecule and now we are looking at uh, using that for diabetes, hypertension, HIV, cancer, or there's an existing uh, product uh, which which has certain toxicity or, or other issues like solubilities. And we're trying to resolve that by offering some functional changes to it. And that was an old approach where you basically design your molecule first, and then you're trying to use that molecule to sort of cure, treat um, different uh, conditions. But modern pharmaceutical research actually has evolved a lot. And the way we approaching things now is like, you need to pay attention to what, let's say, for an example, this COVID virus, what this virus looks like, what it does to the body, how it does different things to the body, and how do we find a particular target in virus structure. And then we start designing our molecule to attack particular target sites. And uh, this is called a rational approach, which is different to the old approach we, we have had. So think about it this way. This is important for you because anybody who is studying medicinal chemistry um, and also people who are studying uh, biotechnologies or biopharmaceutics, um, you will be applying a lot of uh, biochemical technologies or biopharmaceutical approaches to study, um, let's say an enzyme, a cell, a virus, or let's say an, uh, an abnormal condition inside a human body. And then you're looking at um, sort of areas where you can actually do some sort of changes. And how do you do those changes is by by designing a molecule, okay? This is not a molecule that is already there, but you're doing some structural activity relationship. You are doing some sort of computer edit sort of uh, drug development and basically creating this molecule. And that molecule may work in that particular target site, okay? So that is how the modern research is taking place. And we can use um, 
artificial intelligence. In fact, it has been used currently to find cure for COVID virus where um, different uh, computational technologies looked at existing molecules to find if any of those could be used against this virus, okay? And what happens then is that you take this molecule to animal studies. And I, as I said earlier that in an animal study, you have to select minimum two different uh, um, animal models and maybe two different strains of same animal. And one of them has to be closer to, let's say human structure or human body structure. So mostly primates. Um, and then what you actually do is you dissolve your product or you try to dissolve it if it's soluble. And then you try to give it to the highest concentration that's possible for that particular molecule to animal and try to assess the safety or toxicity of this particular molecule. And what you do is actually looking at um, sort of effect in different organs. So you are looking at uh, pharmacokinetics, pharmacodynamics. You're also looking at uh, genotoxicity. You're looking at uh, sort of uh, effect of this particular molecule on reproductive system, cardiac systems, liver, kidney. And then once you establish that, okay, this product is safer in animal model than the, than the minimum dose possible is usually the one tenth of the dose that is shown some sort of effect in animal taken to the first um, phase of clinical studies, which is usually done on eight to 10 human volunteers. And these are healthy human volunteers. And idea is here not to treat the condition, but is to check if this drug is safer in a human body. That is what happens in phase one. And once you have proven that it's safe, then ethical committee may grant you permission to take this to phase two. This is where you register a lot of patients, okay, people who are suffering from particular condition. And look at the variability there because that patient population may come from like uh, um, different groups from different countries, maybe different nationality, different uh, ethnicity, people, obviously um, different stages, different body height, weight. So there are like lots of things that, that can affect your clinical study. So think about it this way, like, um, you know, your metabolic uh, functioning may be different to mine because I eat different food. Maybe I drink more than you drink and I have more of alcohol dehydrogenase enzyme in my liver, which can digest certain molecules quicker than yours. And this sort of intersubject variability may happen. And uh, in the phase two, what scientists are looking at is uh, if this drug is effective, okay, and efficacy, how much does drug that needs to be given to show the desired therapeutic response. And once you have proven that in, in, a, in, in phase two, which is about 200 to 400 patients, then you enter into phase three, which is multi-centered, multi-country, multiple hospitals. I mean, this is what is happening in India at the moment with the, with the vaccine developing, the registering patients in different part of the nation. And then you have that dose, which has shown effect in, in human body and in a stable form, again, when you transition from preclinical to phase one to phase two, this is where between phase one and two, you have to establish your commercial safe, commercial formulation before you can be, you, you, can, you can take it to the, to phase two and three. Um, the idea is that um, at this stage, you have developed sufficient information that this product may have this commercial demand. This product uh, will have sufficient stability. We have done all the characterization and we have developed a manufacturing process where if needed, we can produce this product in large quantities. So in the background, you are developing understanding of, of process of manufacturing. You're also looking at um, sort of um, clinical supply chain where you are trying to create a randomized trial where patients are not aware 
what they are given. I mean, they can be given placebo at a time, which is nothing but sugar pills. And um, they are very similar in terms of their appearance to the molecule which you're trialing in clinical studies. So they look identical, they look similar. And they get given to different patient population at different time. And you will have to allow a washover period between those trials so that same patient population which received the drug or placebo A in one, in, in, in let's say study A, and then the same population receives the other product or placebo or, or let's say the molecule in, in second phase. So what happens is that you allow a washover period between patient population and you alternate placebo and, and, and the drug. So in that study, you are trying to understand, this is statistical term, okay? You need to develop a geometric mean and you have to use analysis of variance, ANOVA, to reduce um, sort of uh, variability that comes from intersubject variability, minor differences in terms of um, how the drug is manufactured. And you make um, sort of assessment to say that this drug is effective, is safe, which you're proven, and it's effective. And it can be effective in a variety of patient population of different age, different weight, different uh, sex, uh, male, female, and uh, maybe people who actually are suffering from some sort of diseases as well. So it's safer for people who already have diabetes or hypertension, overweight people. So there's different things that you're trying to assess at these stages. And one thing that you have done already in the background is you developed your manufacturing process. You developed a strong understanding of how smaller changes to your processes can affect performance of your product. So there are two development happening in parallel. One is you developing understanding of your product itself, safety and efficacy, and you also doing product scale up where you are looking at manufacturability of the product itself. And they both offer their own challenges, okay? And which we will discuss later during the presentation. Um, why these um, studies are important um, because one thing that I always get asked is like why it takes uh, so many years to develop a product. Um, one of the things that a lot of people don't understand is that uh, toxicity is something that may not necessarily appear or, or sort of uh, happen in the same generation. It can happen in the second generation too. Uh, for an example, the thalidomide tragedy, which actually changed the way the whole regulatory industry looked at the molecules, where in 1960s, more than 10,000 10, children suffered um, with this thalidomide tragedy where they were born without uh, hands and or, or, or limbs. They, they actually didn't see the effect uh, in, the, in the generation where this medicine was used, but in the next generation. And uh, there are lots of other examples where the clinical trial failed. And one of the common thing that was kind of identified was that there wasn't much work done either in animal or in the phase one studies where they either looked at the data in great detail or probably they did not understand certain or subtle um, information that was present in the clinical readout. And one of the example here is that one molecule that went into the clinic that could bind to several enzymes. And one of the enzyme was obviously the, the, the target site, which was the fatty acid amide hydrolyze in this example. But the same molecule could bind to other receptors and one of the receptor was present in the brain. So what happened there was uh, this new molecule was taken into the phase two and did not, they did not pay much attention during the phase one, probably it did not manifest in, 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 in eight to 10, um, human volunteers in the phase one. But when this was taken into the phase two, um, a lot of people suffered from different sort of side effects or a few of them died as well, just because this molecule showed some sort of extreme toxicity. And these things can happen, okay? So what we've seen here is that you may see an immediate side effect. You may see an immediate toxicity or that toxicity may manifest in the next generation. So studying effect of or safety of a molecule 
take some time because what you don't want to do is develop something and launch that product, which will be in the market for next 10, 20 years. And knowingly or unknowingly, you are causing more of a, a sort of, a, let's say, damage to the society than the benefit it offers. And that is what regulators try to assess by reviewing all the data you provided to them. Safety is the, is the most important aspect to the, to the regulatory product review and product launch. So your medicine may be effective, but if it's not safe, it will not be launched. Okay, as simple as that. And um, when we actually look at different clinical phases, we are trying to establish that safety efficacy at every stage. That is the most important part of it. Okay, so anybody who is interested in building their career in pharmacovigilance or in clinical research, you know, there's, uh, there's some information there for you. What are the things that you would be sort of doing? seeing, kind of notifying to the regulators and reporting, okay? And when it comes to product development, um, we always uh, come across this sort of chart where like what we've seen here is like um, majority of our new molecules, they suffer from um, one or other issues. Um, the top ranking one is the stability. Stability is something that you study uh, when you actually take in your product uh, from phase one to phase two, because this is where you're trying to establish your commercial um, product. And uh, you need to provide at least six months data at different temperature and humidity with your formulation and final formulation and packaging material to, to, to show that it's, it's, it's sort of stable, okay? And that stability can also be studied during the very early stage of development because if your product is not stable for let's say even 24 hours, then you cannot dose it to humans. Or if you actually are seeing some sort of byproducts which may also have desired or undesired therapeutic effect, then you cannot take this molecule to the clinic. And then other aspect of, um, of, of product development, which is all about bioavailability, making sure that you get the right um, quantity of the medicine to the right target site is equally important. So bioavailability, if the product has poor solubility, you will not get um, sort of a desired effect because it's not gonna reach to the target uh, organs or body. Or if it has poor permeability, then you, know, you may see similar effect. Other thing that may also affect your decision on pharmaceutical companies' decision is cost. A lot of companies in India, in India, they cannot invest in, in developing a molecule which can take up to 10 to, to 14 years to, to come in the market. Because in those, in those uh, 10 to 14 years, what we have is, um, you know, there's a probability, a strong possibility that you, the molecule may not make it to the market, but you still will be investing heavily on, on clinical studies. And not all the companies can, can afford it. So cost is also another aspect of it. Um, what we need to understand is that uh, as a formulation scientist, you will be expected to study these sort of challenges, come up with ideas and suggestions and try to overcome some of those. So we will come to some examples later during the presentation that how we can overcome this sort of uh, challenges. Um, and then the foundation of this all starts with uh, actually understanding the molecule itself. Um, as I said, uh, you need to be able to provide sufficient data to regulators uh, demonstrating that you understand your drug substance, you understand your drug product. And in order to do that, you will be using a lot of analytical technologies because what I have here in my presentation is that uh, a PXRD, which is looking at a sort of crystalline amorphous transition of an active molecule, there are different analytical tools. Uh, second graph is, uh, is, is taken from a DVS, which is dynamic web absorption. And what we're trying to establish is that if you expose your active or product to different relative humidity, moisture, then does it absorb moisture? Or, or what happens when we actually change the temperature? So does it also sort of release the moisture when you heat it up? And then you have different uh, thermo um, let's say thermogrammetric analytical tools, which are looking at um, 
melting point. They're looking at class transition temperature. What I also have tabulated here is the solubility at different pH in different um, gastric media. So in your stomach, there's a different media than in your intestine. And you need to be able to prove to the, to the regulators that you have tested the solubility in different environment. And this product still has some sort of, uh, let's say dissociation solubility or form of ionized versus unionized form available in the intestine for absorption, okay? And again, a lot of you guys are studying analytical sciences. Uh, you will be using some of these technologies to study some of the existing product in the market. But these sort of technologies gets used heavily during the product development and a solid understanding of your drug substance is key to success for issues, um, especially with the stability of the product, okay? So this sort of data, you should be able to generate the data. You should be able to interpret the data. It should be able to compile this data in a report in a format that is easy to understand by your scientists, uh, other scientists or regulators, your managers. And then also you should be able to sort of make an assessment to say that whether we should be taking this molecule further or not. These are the tools which we use for smaller molecules okay but now the future is um, all about biologics it's all about antibodies proteins peptides and uh, in order to characterize a biological compound i mean the the variety of uh, equipment that will be you that you will be expected to use is small shift like this the, we're talking about nearly 20 different techniques um, and they're all looking at primary secondary tertiary structure mainly looking at this activity and stability, okay? And um, the expectation again here is that, uh, first, uh, that you understand your molecule. Second, that you have capability to use the right analytical tool to understand the right sort of challenge that molecule has. You're looking at molecular weight, you're using mass spec, you're looking at sort of tertiary structure, secondary structure, you're using FTIR. You're using higher, you're using uh, technologies like XRD, fluorescence spectroscopy to looking at tertiary structure. You're using peptide mapping again in the mass spec to understand the glycosylization, different techniques, right? And these all techniques are giving you information about certain things in a molecule. They're not giving you complete picture. One technique doesn't give you complete understanding of a molecule. They all, complementary to each other. So one gives one information, other technology gives you different information. And then you as a scientist, uh, compiling that data, looking at the data, and then making an assessment to say that, oh, well, actually um, I see some issue here, or I don't see something, you know, and then when you do certain changes to your manufacturing process or synthetic process, then you repeat this analysis to say that, well, actually, certain changes doesn't affect a certain aspect of this molecule. So all the students who are studying analytical sciences, please pay attention to what you're studying because you will be using that knowledge and understanding in future, all right? So once you have characterized your molecule, you are entering into phase two and phase three. And in those clinical stages, as I said, you will be looking at developing greater understanding of your manufacturing process. Um, so you've done your physical chemical characterization. You have actually looked at the formulation side of it. And formulation is basically what are the uh, other inactive excipients you, you will be using in what ratio and that uh, combination of your active and, and, and inactive excipients is giving you sort of a tablet. And that tablet has, let's say, bulking agent uh, that has disintegrant, that has lubricant. They all have different purposes. Um, and then you have developed analytical method. That method that can detect um, your active can also change, can, can also detect your impurities that may come from your drug substance or that may actually come from your process as well. So these all analytical capabilities, understanding of your product gets reviewed, challenged, and kind of constantly um, investigated when you're actually going at different stages, okay? Because 
what you need to keep in mind is that uh, you will not know everything about uh, the molecule when you are actually in phase one. When you're entering in phase two, you are looking at different scale. When you're going in phase three, you are looking at completely different scale. You're using different machines. And uh, we're gonna come to those process parameters which can affect certain sort of um, critical quality attributes of the product as well. So in a product development, you kind of know what your target, um, let's say, um, disease condition is. You also know your path, how you're gonna compile the data. Now you have established a greater understanding of a molecule. Now you understand a little bit about your formulation and you have developed an analytical method that can actually look at uh, or identify your active as well as uh, impurities in your product. And that analytical method is capable enough to distinguish smaller changes uh, and that small changes may happen during the stability study of that product. And then what you actually also do is like bring some variables to your manufacturing process. So that variability may come from, let's say, a different particle size of API, a different particle size from your supplier. Imagine you change your supplier for API yeah, during the commercial development. So the product uh, drug substance you were receiving from one manufacturer, maybe they may be chemically equivalent, but physically different. It is possible because they may be using different synthetic approaches to it or different equipment to it. And now suddenly the performance of your product has changed because the density has changed, the particle size distribution has changed, um, smaller particle, larger surface area of exposure, larger surface area of exposure, faster dissolution, so your dissolution performance has suddenly changed, okay? And you can actually intentionally introduce these all variables during the development of your product. And that way you can provide confidence to your regulators that, well, actually we have studied certain variables that may come from drug substance, that may come from excipient, and we also have looked at process variables where by changing the machines, by using machines to different scales, different operators, different time, we actually can this, produce this product consistently. And, and, and that is what they're looking for. They are looking for uh, information where you have provided them sufficient data that gives them confidence that actually you understand your product really well. And um, once they, get that confidence, then, you know, they're kind of happy to give you certification. Um, and, and that certification will allow you to launch your product in the market, okay? So just an example, the type of challenges you may see when you move from a smaller scale to a larger scale. This is an example of a product where when you move from a smaller scale granulator, this, this is a weight granulation process weight granulation process is used for development of tablets. When we're moving from a smaller granulator, let's say 20, 30 kg batch to a medium sized granulator, which is about like 50, 60 kg, and then to a larger size granulator, which is uh, let's say two to 300 kgs. What we were seeing is that uh, the same product developed at different scales, scales was showing different type of performance in terms of dissolution testing. So dissolution is one of your critical quality attribute and dissolution is always used as a, as a, as a sort of a, a process check where you are trying to develop a correlation of your in vivo performance. And the way you do it is like you have a dissolution profile, which has taken from let's say phase one of the clinical study. And that phase one clinical study and that dissolution, phase one or phase two, and that dissolution profile is something that you kind of keep as a benchmark, as a standard. And subsequently, all the batches you manufacture has to match the same dissolution profile. Okay, so what we were seeing here is that when we're moving from a smaller scale to larger, the dissolution was changing. And that simply means the product was not meeting the desired uh, manufacturability or release criteria. And what we actually investigated there was that uh, the smaller granulator required 
slightly different water content for granulation, slightly different weight massing time. So we had to optimize our water content. And as you can see that the small scale was using 15% water. The medium sized granulator was using 17% water. And then the larger scale granulator used 18%. And the massing time changed from four to six minutes. Okay. So at different stages, the message is this, at different stages, you may have to optimize your process to meet the desired dissolution profile. And the way you do it is by playing with certain process variables. Uh, on this occasion, we used uh, weight massing time and, and obviously the water content as a, as a variable. And that study demonstrated that, uh, that um, by changing those process parameters, you can actually change your dissolution profile. Okay, and now what you're also demonstrating is that you understand your product because by reducing the water, by adding more water, by doing less or more of wet mashing, you can actually change the performance of your product. Okay, that's that's good in a way because you understand your product now. Okay, and this happens all the time because you develop your product at such a scale, very small scale, very small batches, and then you actually moved to larger scale. Okay, and that happens when their commercial demand has gone up. You actually supplying to phase three different, uh, um, different uh, obviously patient population, different countries. So your commercial volume has gone up. Okay, so we talked about uh, in vitro in vivo correlation briefly in earlier slide, and this is important because um, theoretically, what we're making uh, uh, an assumption about is that everybody has a similar sort of bioperformance, but that's not a fact, right? Because everybody has slightly different, um, let's say, um, organ size, uh, different age, different metabolic um, sort of performance. And um, when you give a product to eight or 10 human volunteer, then you give it to 200 to 300 patients. We are giving it to patients, right? The, their metabolic activity is already affected because of disease condition. So there are a lot of variables. And as I said, like your variability can also come from your process from smaller to large. That can also come from your drug substances or excipients. If there's a change of supplier of excipients or API, change of particle size, density, uh, even the water content, things like that. And what actually you have to keep in mind is that when you're releasing a product in the market, how do you ensure that every single batch has been manufactured to the right quality, which actually went into the clinic? So that is your benchmark. What went in the clinic is your benchmark. That is what you're trying to achieve every time you manufacture a batch subsequently. So in the commercial launch and in the commercial process, you're manufacturing, let's say, two to 300 batches every year. How do you ensure that um, every single batch is releasing the right amount of drug at right time. So this is actually studied by doing sort of in vitro, in vivo correlation. Again, there's a statistical term for it, F1, F2 studies, um, looking at similarity and difference factor. And what actually that does is actually check in how much drug is released in 30 minutes, 45 minutes, ensuring that there's sufficient drug release within first 30 minutes inside your stomach so that is available for absorption in intestine. And uh, by looking at different patient population, by doing a statistical evaluation, you can come to a conclusion that actually, they, they actually, your, your dissolution method is discriminatory enough, first, that it can pick up smaller changes to your product. Second, that um, if there's smaller changes to your dissolution performance, you know, how that actually correlates with um, is performance inside the human body. And you make that assessment to say that, well, actually smaller changes will not have bigger effect to, to human population, provided that you release 80% of your drug or 90% of your drug in first 30 minutes of drug being, or dose being administered and, and or, or probably 100% in, in less than 60 minutes. So this sort of specification is applied uh, during the batch release every time you manufacture the product. And that release specification is important. Otherwise, it's indication that something is not quite right with your product during the, during the manufacturing. And that is used for different investigational purposes all the time in industry, all right? 
And what we actually saw here when we were scaling up our process that um, as you can see in two different plots, there were different water contents. First one is all about looking at manufacturability where we've done some changes to our product, intentional changes. Okay, we changed their hardness, we applied different compression pressure. We actually changed um, their water content. We've done this intentionally, okay. What we wanted to study is that if we intentionally change our manufacturing process or that may happen, you know, one operator may accidentally put more water one day if it's not recipe controlled or they may apply more compression pressure because that operator was not trained and things like that happen all the time. With those all changes in manufacturability, the right plot kind of suggests that the dissolution performance doesn't change much. And that is what we want to see in a stable product. Yeah, that smaller changes to your manufacturability should not alter the bioperformance and you use in dissolution as a way of monitoring it. So in this plot here, what we've seen is a stable product where those all manufacturability changes did not affect the dissolution performance of the product, which means the product is very stable. And that is what you want to develop, a very stable product. And uh, you know this variability, as I said, can come from different places. But if you have a robust process, if you have a robust product, then those smaller changes will not affect the performance of the product ultimately. Yeah, that's the intent here. And then what we have is a different streams, which again runs in parallel. And this development stream is looking at enhancing the solubility or permeability of the compound. As you all aware that now we use a scientific approach where we study the solubility and permeability of the compound during the development. And during my presentation in the first slide, I mentioned that I worked at QCEPT where, as you can see here, there are different molecules with different chemical nature. Some of them have poor solubility. Some of them have poor permeability. And what we're trying to do here is that by using different techniques, we can kind of address these sort of challenges. And the way we do it is by changing their chemical nature. Okay. so. BCS class four is the compound with the low solubility and low permeability. And um, as I said, you may have molecules which have, you know, slightly different chemical characteristics, which making them not very desirable. Pharmaceutical companies, they go like, this is not soluble, this is not permeable. So I can't dose it, I can't give it to human because it's not gonna work. So what they do is like, if the molecule is promising in a way that it has, all the right functional group to target a particular enzyme or receptor, they give it to smaller companies. And those smaller companies may be working on one of these uh, novel technologies like developing an amorphous formulation, developing a lipid product, a solid lipid uh, nanoparticle, emulsion, self emulsifying system, spray drying, freeze drying. So those all novel techniques uh, which actually can help solubilizing the compound and by increasing the solubility uh, that drug is available for absorption. Okay, or you can also affect the permeability um, by dissolving in a vehicle which makes it more absorbable or lipophilic. So there are challenges which you may see during the development. And uh, all I have tried to do today is to give you different scenarios, different examples where you will be sort of coming across this sort of challenges You'll be using your analytical capability, scientific understanding, pharmaceutical learning to come up with ideas. And those ideas will be mainly to deal with the challenges you may have from you know, manufacturing, API, analytical methods, clinical data, trying to tune different product formulations and coming with this sort of novel approaches where you can also address the challenges you may have with some of the, some of the more challenging actives. And hopefully, you know, after this uh, all presentation, you have a little bit more understanding of pharmaceutical research. What you also need to understand or appreciate that we don't know answer all the time. And that is good. That is okay. Because whole idea of scientific evolution is that you keep learning, you keep utilizing your scientific capability challenging yourself 
stretching it to the maximum and taking it to the new boundaries where you are looking at um, challenging situation, but you're also trying to find ways to overcome it. And this is what drug development is all about. If everything was so easy, you know, the scientific community wouldn't be paying you well. And if it was so easy, anybody could do it. You won't need to have four years of education in more than 50 different subjects. So everything you study today is pretty much relevant. It's pretty much useful. Please pay attention to what you studying and this all education knowledge gained will definitely be utilized in future. And um, that brings us to the end of this presentation today. Thank you so much for taking time to listening to this presentation. I really hope you enjoyed this and I'll be more than happy to take uh, questions if there are any. Thank you, sir, for your valuable insights from your experience and for sharing with us in detail about the drug development process and challenges in it. Thank you. We shall now take up some of the questions put up by our students and the audience on the Facebook. The sure. first question is, please explain about quality by design concept in the search and development of new drug. Mm -hmm. Quality by design itself is a, is a, is a topic um, and, uh, and uh, the concept of quality by design um, came about 20 years ago when we started um, sort of looking at uh, challenges, uh, uh, especially around um, uh, manufacturability. In one of the slides, uh, let me put that slide back. Um, this is a classical example of a QBD approach. And uh, in the QBD, there are a few things which are important. First is uh, you understand your process, which is all about identifying your critical process parameters, any process variables can affect, that can affect uh, the critical quality attributes of the product, okay? And critical quality attributes are any chemical, physical, biopharmaceutical sort of properties uh, which can be affected and um, the change in their sort of, let's say, range or distribution can affect uh, the bioperformance of the product. So in this particular example here, what we, done is that we change our process parameter. And in the next slide, what we demonstrated that uh, by changing certain process parameters, the CQA, which is dissolution here, is not affected. So quality by design was intended to develop a robust process, a develop a greater understanding, a develop a greater understanding in terms of process variables, where they may come from, what may also happen if um, those process variables are introduced in your product or in your manufacturing process. And then you come up with sort of design space, okay? This design space is quite big, okay? And it, in that design space, you have sort of find your sweet spot, which is a smaller. In that sweet spot, what you're saying is that a smaller changes in the product perform in, in smaller changes in any process variables or active or drug science or excipients will not affect the product performance, okay? And then you have a knowledge space, which is larger than your design space. Because within that knowledge space, what you're saying is that um, um, I, I understand I don't have sufficient data, but I do understand that if you take uh, this process to its extreme, let's say you compress your tablet to the maximum hardness, then after certain hardness, the performance of the product will go out of specification. And um, that understanding comes from, you know, obviously from historical data because you may have worked on similar product or technology or process, or that may also come from designing experiments. Okay, so you basically find variables that may affect your product and then you design your studies in a way that you take your process to extremes, okay? And now you have data, which kind of gives you information that by changing one process from X to Y can affect your product performance to this degree, okay? And that all concept of identifying your critical process parameter, understanding your critical quality attributes, designing uh, experiments, finding the design space, knowledge space, 
there is all encompassed uh, inside uh, the concept of quality by design. The objective is to come up with um, a robust product, which can be produced every time you manufacture this particular product using the scientific knowledge, equipment, capability, technical skills you have. And um, the concept can be applied to development of active substances because they are process variables. That concept can also be applied to analytical method development because there are variables in analytical method. And that principle and concepts are actually applied throughout the life cycle of product, you know, not necessarily just during the launch um, because your process is evolving. You may be moving from one equipment to another equipment. You may be moving from one scale to another scale from one manufacturing site to another manufacturing site. And as I said, you may be changing your supplier, let's say supplier of your active. So if you don't understand your process variables, if you don't understand your process variables, you don't understand your critical quality attributes well, then uh, you, know, you may end up with a product uh, with uh, um, suboptimal performance. And by applying quality by design principles and approach, this is what you're trying to avoid. Developing greater understanding of product is the ultimate objective of QBD principles. Thank I you, hope sir. Answer the question here. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. The next question is: What type of knowledge and skills are required to work in the R and D sector, and what will be the responsibility of the person? Sure, uh, it's a very good question, actually. Um, as a student, uh, you know, most of the time we get asked. Um, that what, what it takes to become a scientist. Um, and uh, as I said at the beginning of my presentation that it's not just the scientific skill, it's the interpersonal skills as well. Because you know your molecules may be offering you certain challenges, but uh, what you may come across also is that challenges that you may come from you know, your colleagues, your management. If you, if you are actually very good in terms of your scientific knowledge, understanding of medicinal chemistry, pharmacology, biopharmaceutics, analytical sciences, it's all good. But if you cannot convince your colleague or your managers, you're not gonna go far, okay? Because they will make sure that you don't progress. So having PhD, having a specific knowledge and uh, having lots of publications, um, books, it's all good. But um, in order to become a scientist, you need to have a scientific and rational thinking. That's the most important thing. And you need to have a desire, a deep desire within you that you want to you want to do it, okay? And when you have that ultimate ambition, then, um, you know, sometimes the path will appear in front of you. Make sure you get your foundation right, so spend good time studying different streams. You definitely need good understanding of medicinal chemistry, pharmacology, and biopharmaceutics because the streams are changing in a way that we're moving from a smaller molecule to larger molecule. So you may want to put some emphasis or attention to biotechnology, biochemistry as well, because that is where the future is heading. And uh, by studying uh, obviously this sort of streams, uh, what you also need to develop is your interpersonal skills. So you're ready for future, okay? Uh, you need to have a good communication skill. You need also to have a great presentation style and also you need to be able to sort of demonstrate that you can work with people, okay? This is a very important. Um, again, different people have different uh, opinion about it, but personally what I've learned is that um, um, to become a leader, you need to be a follower first, okay? So you need to learn first and learn from good people around you. You know, there are lots of people out there who will be able to help you in your journey, find mentors, coaches who can, who already made that journey before you. Okay, find people who already are in R&D. Uh, try to establish uh, links with them. Go for industrial training. See what's, what's happening there. And then actually start adopting your approach in life. Okay, I say the word adopt because nobody is perfect. We always are learning, okay? And that learning, you know, first comes from your, from your subject matter, subject books. And then it comes from experiences you gain as you move progress, uh, as you move forward in your life. Okay, so um, the life is the greatest teacher you will have. You may fail sometime in your interview. You may not probably like the industrial environment because there's too much politics, but in order to succeed, you know, you have to 
be very patient. Uh, you need to be continuously learning new things. Read a lot. Spend some time studying articles because, you know, when you're good at articulating your facts, ideas, knowledge, then people generally, generally they like you. Okay. So in order to, to become a scientist, uh, you need to um, really work hard in a way that um, there are certain things which which always uh, comes with a high price tag and scientist role is one of them because you expected to know so many different things and you know expectation is quite high so um i wouldn't um, i wouldn't um, again say that uh, you know just uh, scientific field is is the only way forward you may develop yourself uh, as a great leader uh, even if you are very good at in terms of finances commercial organization clinical products uh, um, sort of uh, um, supply. There's there's streams in the statistical field, clinical research. So there's like variety of areas where you can apply your scientific knowledge and understanding. Okay. So have the desire, have the passion, and find people who already are in research. And that way you start seeing the ladder. You will start seeing things that you may need to develop because there's no simple answer to this. You know, each person is different. You know, certain students maybe may be very good at um, you know, speaking, articulating. Uh, a lot of time, people who are very good at academically, they're not very good at um, you know, working with people. And that may well happen with you know, some of you. So try to balance it out. It's not easy. And I, I feel like you know, maybe I'm not giving you a clear answer as well, but um, um, idea is that try to balance it out. Um, People will help you moving forward, but your scientific knowledge will actually take you farther.